Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, isn't it? This is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. The former account I made, I see off, and you had to say this wrong, Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptised with water, but you shall be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Bless you all. Thank you. I'm going to do a, a shamelessly do a bit of a plug uh, before I begin the message because I know some of you are, um, have been invested in the things that I've been doing and some of you maybe don't know so much. As is mentioned, I've been in Vietnam for the last mm, 25 years, but I've been in Asia now for more than 40 years, uh, first working in, uh, Viet- in Thailand with Indo-Chinese refugees. I consider it a great privilege to have um, had the opportunity, not always easy, but to really have that opportunity to see God at work in the world. And I'm very grateful for those who have partnered with me over those years because I recognize that we don't do these things by ourselves. That when God calls, it's not just a one-person call. He calls a whole group of people to be involved, to be in praying, to be giving, and um, some of us to go. So I want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you for those, for, for this church that has um, been supporting me over the last few years. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my primary focus has been in Vietnam, has really been community development, because uh, what I saw, I think, with my time in in Thailand, I, I had this heart to see change happen at grassroots level where people are empowered to bring change in their own communities. And so that became a bit of a passion of mine and continues to be a passion of mine. And now, of course, I have the opportunity not just to do the stuff, but to teach this so that others can go other places in the world and bring change to their communities as well. And it was that process that got me caught out, if you like. I was in, um, in Indonesia, in Bali, um, teaching on a community development course there when uh, the airport started to close down and it became impossible for me to go back to Vietnam. And I ended up in New Zealand I kind of laugh because we make plans, but God orders steps. And we ultimately, we can be frustrated by that, or we can say, God, you're in this for a reason. I wasn't planning even to come back to New Zealand this year, and now I have spent the longest in New Zealand that I have since I left 40 years ago. Those are the ways of God. And I see the wisdom in what he's done in me even while I've been here. It's probably been the best rest I've had because I haven't been able to initially, during lockdown, I had, couldn't run around and visit people or go to church or anything like that. And so it was really a, a good rest. 
But of course, things have begun to um, gear back up and I'm working online pretty much most days and many hours every day. And part of that has been a growing thing for me on in mentoring others. You know, I'm at the stage now where I'm, for the last few years, I've been saying, God, where are we going with this? And how can I make sure that what's happening now is sustainable? Well, at least the parts that you want to continue uh, to, uh, to grow and to remain, then how are we going to make it sustainable? And <laughs> once again, I've seen my staff rise up and um, really take responsibility and um, are moving forward in a way that probably wouldn't have happened if I was right there on the spot. But we're at this stage in our normal cycle of um, activities where once a year we go in and we, in the communities where we're working and we're working in two, three, four, maybe eight communities and um, we look for the children who are at most at risk. Jesus said, suffer the children to come to me for such is the kingdom of heaven. And we want these kids to have opportunity for a better future. So we provide them with education assistance. We do it once a year, and we provide school bags, um, books, um, uniforms if they need it, and sometimes we even are able to provide bicycles for kids who have a long way to go to school. We want to encourage them to keep moving forward in their education because if they get a better education, then more opportunities are available to them. And they can be the key for getting their families out of poverty. The other kind of um, motive I have is not just helping the children, but also helping the community leaders become aware of the situation of the children in their communities. So part of the deal is my staff work with community leaders and together they go and assess these children. We set the criteria uh, before we go and visit the children because the needs are overwhelming. So we, we work out what are, the, what, you know, what are the most difficult circumstances and of those, which ones should be ranked first, second and third. And if we do that beforehand, it's much easier when we go because we're always emotionally touched by what we see. And uh, from that process, it becomes very clear which children should get help first. And if somebody questions, they can, we, we can show them very clearly why these children got help first and maybe if we had more, we could have helped these others, but we only have a certain amount of resources. So this year, it's been a bit of a faith journey for me um, because normally I'm busy raising funds for this. And... Um, um, so I just had to set a target and said, God, I want to help at least 490 children this year. I hope it's 500. It costs about 30 New Zealand dollars per child for the year. And it's just a one-off thing. But anyway, maybe you know somebody who might be interested in, in, in taking on a child for a year. We, it's not a sponsorship per se. We can give you information about kinds of kids we help. But, um, and we have a list very clearly who we help every year. So it's just a one-off gift, and maybe you can share this need with others. Of course, we still have our children's homes. We have um, 55 children now in care, living in three homes. We try to make a point that each child is special. They all have their own uh, unique giftings and abilities, and... Um, during lockdown, we, in, in Vietnam, schools were closed from the 22nd of January. So they were closed for a long time. They didn't come back and start um, back in school until mid-May. So at the moment, they're going crazy because they have to complete the curriculum. Um, it's already summer holidays normally in Vietnam at the beginning of June. But the schools have decided to stay open until mid-July, which, you know, sounds great, but it means the kids have to be really focused, and the temperatures at the moment are around about 38. 
And we're not talking air-conditioned classrooms here and sometimes not even electricity in some remote places. So it's tough for these kids to be studying at this time. And then they, um, the school year finishes in, in mid-July. And then after in mid-July, then we do the assessment so the kids are, have all that they need before the beginning of September when this new school year starts in Vietnam. So please be praying for that and that um, God would really be with the kids that we're trying to help. Um, for our kids in our homes, these 55 kids, it's total care. It's everything that they need. It's education. We, it's life skills. It's leisure time activities. And we want each child to uh, reach their full potential. So... Um, We've seen some amazing things happen. Kim Zum there, a few years ago, I put some urgent pleas around to pray for her. She had meningitis. And she ended up in a coma for, I think it was a month and a half. And the doctors basically gave up on her. But I thought, you know, God is a God who works miracles. And um, they said, if she comes out of this then for sure she's going to have major, major uh, disabilities. Well, she's come out of it. She's worked really hard at her um, rehab. She's now back top of her class. And not only that, but she's winning athletic prizes. God has completely restored her. It's really a miracle. And so these things are, you know, it's total care, so it's a bit more expensive. But it, maybe you know somebody who would like to take on, the, on a, a caring for a child. And uh, we send out reports every quarter about how the child's doing. Or um, for a child that's going to university, it costs more money. If a child has the capacity to uh, go to university, we want to make sure that they reach their maximum potential or um, even with me um, um, co-sponsoring a child. I have some cards with me about various children that we still need to um, find sponsors for. And, you know, it might not be you, but maybe you know somebody who might be interested in doing that, or your workplace might take on one or something like that. So anyway, that's my little commercial plug. Other, other uh, work, which is actually... These are kind of side things that we do. Our main work is really helping people overcome poverty through things like cow banks and microcredit and so on and so forth. And, and why? Because I believe that the kingdom of God is about bringing good news to the poor. I believe that the kingdom of God can set people free financially, can, set, can heal relationships can see people become um, worthwhile, productive members of their society who can give back to others. And if we can create that sense of community, I believe the kingdom of, that's part of the kingdom of God coming to a place. We read this morning from Acts, um, and I just want to focus on that because I know during lockdown, um, many of us realized how much we like to come together. And it was a good time to stop and say, okay, what is church? Why do we gather together? What's the point? And so I just thought I would just share with you very briefly just... Um, what I, the understanding that I've got through this time, because living in New Zealand during this time and experiencing lockdown and trying to do online church and realizing how great it was to come together, that um, it's good to really examine that again. Well, first of all, we know that this is, Paul, this is uh, Luke's second book that he wrote. The first one he, he tells Theophilus, that wonderful word, um, about all that Jesus began to do and preach. But we call this the Acts of the Apostles, but actually it's the Acts of Jesus 
and the Holy Spirit. And I think a better way of putting it would Paul now continues to tell about the things that Jesus began to, had to continue to do and preach. And, the, and we see this opening up. The resurrections happened. And here Jesus is 40 days giving the last commands, if you like, the most important things, the things that he wants to emphasize. And I see two things. The first one is about the kingdom of God. And it's kind of interesting because they still didn't get it. You know, they came to him and they said, but um, is this the time now where you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were so focused on themselves that they didn't get the, biggest, the bigger picture. Because the kingdom isn't just about Israel. The, the dream of God was that the whole earth would be full of his glory. The kingdom of God is not contained in a nation. The kingdom of God is not contained in the church even. And Jesus said, you can't do this by yourself. Wait. Oh, that's a hard word for us doers, isn't it? Wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, he will give you the power to do the things that I'm calling you to do. And that is what? It's actually to take the kingdom of God to the world. Jesus' message is about the kingdom of God because God's dream was to bless the nations. Now, an interesting thing, in the Old Testament, we saw that some of the signs of the presence of God in the temple were what? They were fire and wind and cloud, right? But what happens here? The fire comes. Usually, in the Old Testament, we see these pictures of, you know, the tabernacle and then this pillar of fire, but in the imagery in Acts, what we see is we see the fire, but it breaks up and lands on everybody who believes, individuals. Because Jesus is saying, my, my presence does not dwell in a building. You are the new temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is on you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Wherever you go, you bring my presence. And so what do we see happen? We see the, the disciples go out and they began to share. And everybody heard from all the known world. They heard in their own languages. But that was just the beginning. Just the beginning because Ultimately, even what we saw is that the disciples were still focused only on Israel. And they were all the different groups in Israel who had come to Jerusalem for the feast at that time. But the work of the Holy Spirit was much, much bigger than that. And we see later on that actually it took persecution for the disciples to go out and to fulfill the work of God. So missions, if you like, is the mission of the church. God calls us to this bigger picture. He calls us, you see, when he saves us, he saves us from sin, but he also saves us from ourselves and our inward focus. And it's so easy if you like, to be with people who are the same as us. And, you know, we can become very comfortable, but our goal in life is not comfort. And we have to keep reminding ourselves because we like to be around people who are the same as us. I don't know about you, but I do. You know, kind of a peaceful life would be very nice. But that's not the goal of our lives. That's not the purpose of our lives. 
And if that becomes a purpose of our life, then we kind of develop what we call this lifeboat mentality, where we all stay in this lovely holy huddle and we enjoy God's presence and we have a nice time, but we are completely cut off from the needs around us. In Vietnam, I've seen that in, in churches, in Christian groups, you know, and I think partly it's because of the persecution they've faced that it's very easy for them to become insular, where when somebody becomes a Christian, they want them to cut off all the ties because they're afraid. And they, they want them to spend every kind of, every time the church is open, they want them to be there meeting with other Christians. And um, when the church does outreach activities, it's kind of like a, foray, if you like, into the world. And so they go out and they do evangelism and then they bring everybody back and everybody's back into the holy huddle. So what's wrong with that? Is that the way God intended for us to be? Well, firstly, the first problem I have is actually that kind of mentality is based on fear. We're afraid we're afraid of the world out there. We're afraid that they're somehow going to contaminate us or influence us or lead us astray. And we don't realize that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And it's never good to make decisions based on fear. And secondly, if you put all the salt and you keep it in a jar... It stays nice and pure, but it's ineffective. The goal for salt is to make things tasty. The goal for salt is to preserve things. But if it stays in the jar, it doesn't achieve its goals. God calls us to go out, to be salt, to be light, to be influencers in the places where he has us. And thirdly, how can people know about Jesus if they can't see us? You see, the gospel is not what we say. It's how we live. It's how we care. It's how we love. That's the gospel. If our, we can say it all we like, but if our life does not match, if people cannot interact enough with us to, to see our lives then how can they ever know about Jesus' love? How can they ever hear the good news, even when it gets spoken? Yeah, we need each other. There, there is no, no um, doubt about that because I believe that in Ephesians, it says that we're to meet together. Why? To encourage each other to love and good works. We are called, it's in fact, Hebrews says, don't neglect meeting together as is a, in the habit of some because we need to be here to be encouraging one another, to be equipping one another, to be praying for one another, not just to stay here, but so that we can go out and be effective in the relationships, in the circles that God has us be in at this time, to be the influencers that he's calling us to be, wherever it is that we are. So he's not called us to be comfortable. He's called us to be life changers. But it's not just about location, because we can say, oh yeah, well, you know, God's called me to Masterton. Here I am. It's really nice, St. James. Oh, we're, we're doing well. But that's not enough. It's not big enough. God's much bigger than that. We read in the scripture that the call, if you like, was, for, was, was to Jerusalem. They were all staying in Jerusalem, right, at that time. And to Judea. Some of them were from Judea, so that's easy. But then we get a tricky one, Samaria. Now, Samaria is tricky. Why? Well, most of them hated the Samaritans. 
You see, for Jewish people, the Samaritans were the ones who were, you know, theologically incorrect. They were inferior to them. They were not the chosen. And they had somehow been, were labeled as inferior and below and beneath. So my question is to us, who are our Samaritans? Who have we grown up with a prejudice against? Who do we have reserves towards? We don't want to be around those people. God calls us to those people. He calls us to be involved. Now, what I love about Jesus is he was so radical. Because if you think back into some of the stories he told, we don't realize how radical they are. But in many of the stories that Jesus told, the Samaritans were the heroes, not the Jews. The good Samaritan... Who was, in the, who was in need? It was the Jewish man in need and it was the Samaritan who came to his rescue after many others had passed him by. When you go cross-culturally, it's a real challenge because sometimes we go with this superior idea that we have all the answers and we have this message. But God calls us to humble ourselves and be learners. And what I discovered is that many, many people have a bigger picture of God or should I say uh, maybe even living closer to the ways that God desires for us than we are as Westerners. And I have things I need to learn from them because God has been at work in their culture as well. And am I willing to humble myself and learn those things and receive from them? Not just being the one who kind of comes in with all the answers, but coming to receive and to be served so that God's way in my life would even be clearer. You know, something about when you're in need, it breaks down barriers. I remember when I first uh, moved to Vietnam and oh, I moved into this house and my landlord was not interested in anything and the neighbors all rallied. They came and they helped me figure out the electricity and the water and um, helped me get rid of all the rats and helped me even show me how to clean out the, um, the water tank and they, they helped me so much and I was so in debt to them. And we had this amazing relationship. God used my need to break down the barriers. And God calls us to those Samaritans. Are we willing to humble ourselves and to allow God to work and break down the, pre- the de- maybe even unknown, unconscious prejudices we have towards people? Because the call is to Samaria. And to all the other places on earth. Now, the interesting thing that I noticed as I was reading to this is that so often we read these scriptures, and I've been guilty of this. You read what you think you see, (laughs) and we read first to Jerusalem, and then to um, Judea, and then to Samaria, and then. It's like a sequential thing. But there's no then in there. It's and, 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 and. We are called to it all. And you might say, well, how can I be called to it all when I live in Masterton? It's a question of perspective. It's a question of obedience. But it's I think in this day and age, we have the capacity now to be connected with the whole world in a way that we never had before. 
we have the capacity to hear what's going on and to pray. I heard this prayers this morning for people with COVID. You know, we're blessed in New Zealand with so few now. But there are many, many very desperate places in the world. And our, the call on us is to pray. The call on us is to be involved and not shut ourselves off in our nice little huddle. And we, the, the call on us is to ask God, God, for me, where is my Judea? Where is my Samaria? Where is my utmost parts of the earth, all of the earth? Where do you want me to be involved, to be praying, to be giving, to be aware, to be um, informed about what's going on in those places of the world. You see, we need a kingdom perspective. We can be doing one thing, but the way we do it, are we, are we doing it in faith? There was three stone cutters, and you, I saw this cartoon, and it just spoke to me. And the first stone cutter, he's cutting away the stones. And someone asked him, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm cutting stones. He went to the next man, and he said, who was also there, the stone cutter cutting stones, and he asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm supporting my family. I'm making a living. And I'm doing that through cutting stones. The third man, he went over to him and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral. What a different perspective. They're doing the same thing. Do we have a kingdom perspective on what God's called us to? Because if we do, we will have faith for that thing. I remember years ago, I was really struggling. I was, had just taken over leadership of a team, and what could go wrong did go wrong. We had some um, issues within the team that was really hard, really, really tough. Then we had sickness. In fact, I got dengue fever and I probably was having a little bit of um, post-dengue depression. So just everything seemed overwhelming. And then we had a robbery. We were looking after postal services and we had a robbery. And so I had to deal with authorities and, and a few other things that happened during that time. And then to make matters worse, kind of the crown in the jewel of problems, if you like, was our staff were going into camp one day and there was a big truck coming towards them. Our driver moved off to the side of the road and unfortunately hit and killed a man. So we had to deal with that situation, including the fact that, that one of my team got arrested and was put in prison in Thailand for that. I felt overwhelmed. I felt overwhelmed from the first one and it just got heavier and heavier and heavier. And it was just way, way too much for me. And then someone said, well, you need to go to this conference in Hong Kong. And I thought, oh, I don't want to go to a conference in Hong Kong. I just can, I'm barely surviving. But I, I prayed about it and I felt I should go. I didn't know why. Well, that first night in worship, I came into the presence of God with others, which is why we need each other. And I just remember crying. And I, and I said, God, it's too much. There's too many things going wrong. And I remember the Lord speaking to me, but just that quiet whisper saying, you're looking at the giants. Lift your eyes. And I realized, oh, that's right. All I could see were the big problems, the big issues that were happening. And God, you're bigger than that. And as, um, as the week went on, and I began to hear what God was doing in other parts of the world, people who were facing just as bigger issues as me and sometimes even bigger issues than me, and the way God had met them, 
And what happened was my faith was built. And I saw through God's eyes what was going on. I needed a change of vision. Did that solve any of my problems? No. The problems were real that I had been facing. But then I saw God is bigger than those problems. I can trust him in each one of these situations. My vision had changed. I needed a kingdom perspective. And I don't know where you're at today, what you're struggling with, but I believe God would want to give you his perspective, his kingdom perspective. It's not just about your problem. It's about what God is wanting to do through you. Sometimes the biggest example that we can be is how, how we cope with problems. It's not the absence of problems. It's how we, how we dwell in them, how we live in them, how we see God in the midst of that. And that releases faith. And that releases the Holy Spirit to work because that's what builds the kingdom. Our simple acts of obedience. You might never go overseas, and maybe you will. Maybe God will call some of you to go. And we need to be obedient to what he calls us to. But he for sure is calling all of you to be involved in some way. Because he wants to give you a bigger vision. He wants to give you his kingdom perspective. And that's the way he's going to grow his church. That's the way his vision, his dream is going to be fulfilled on the earth. That the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen.